All right. All right. Good morning, Tom. Uh, to our audience, I'm just really, I can't tell you how excited I am. We have the living legend trader, um, really humble guy, incredibly smart and uh, with goes without saying incredibly uh, successful Tom Basso. And instead of going too fat, far, Tom, into the whole introduction and background, which I can do, you know, in the the write up of a, of, a, of a Zoom video, I think we'll just get cut right into the chase. Um, wanted to ask you, I got some some of my friends on LinkedIn, some of our mutual friends had um written in some emailed questions for you. And uh, okay. I want to make sure I, I uh, you know, pay a homage to, to our friends. So the very first question we have is, is the VIX a broken indicator? Uh, uh, the gentleman seemed to, to have some qualms with watching the VIX. I think the VIX is a, to a certain extent a, I don't know that it's broken. It is, um, if you're using it for just triggering trades, I kind of, I lump it into a big category called filter indicators mm. where you're taking data and you're trying to find extremes by uh, say a certain indicator or prices going in a certain direction and becoming overinflated to the upside or overinflated, uh, deflated to the downside. And VIX is attempting to try to capture that I have a problem in general with filter indicators, except for very short-term periods where you're trying to trade like intraday, uh, where you're trying to get extreme points and then go the other way very quickly. And you're only gonna be in for an hour or less. That I think makes more sense. But from a long-term standpoint, what I find with things like VIX and other filters like that, where you're trying to measure overbought, oversold conditions, I believe you can get to a point where markets can stay in that same condition for a long period of time. Mm. And if you're using that, let's say, uh, an oversold condition to buy into stocks, let's say, and it stays oversold, let's say for the next oh, two, years, two years, that's not going to be a fun ride. <laughs> you're going to be getting <laughs> in and then you're going to be saying, whoa, that didn't work out. And if your stop loss is uh, appropriate, you're going to be getting out of it. And then you're going to look at the VIX and say, well, I need to do another long trade. And then you're going to, you're going to just keep doing long trades on one direction. And, um, you know, the mood of the, of all the participants in the markets gets sour and it might last a long time before, you know, something happens out there with the economy or change in government, uh, whatever that triggers some kind of a mood elevation and gets you out of this funk that the market can get into. So I worry about the using things like VIX for, for an indicator. It is what it is. I don't think any math can be dead. It's simply a measurement of, you know, the volatility and the, you know, the extremes and trying to, trying to do a gauge of, is this uh overbought or oversold it just i question whether you use it for timing in any way okay so it's not so much the, the metric itself it's how you use it yes you know, oh, if you okay, want a, okay. just a condition and get a feel for it fine just don't rely on it too much because it could get pegged one way for a, a long period of time and you would be going the wrong way all of the time yeah. it would be the opposite of trend following okay okay we definitely don't want to we definitely don't want to do that um this question is a good question. Um, what are the personal qualities that make for a good trader? Wow. And I know we, I'm sorry, that we could probably uh, do a whole session on just that. So we could do a weekend on that probably uh, <laughs> yeah. two days. Yeah. Um, let's see. The qualities I think are the ability to be rational, number one. Uh, I think to be balanced from a, both a reward and a fear or risk standpoint. And what I mean by that is you'll find some people just so afraid to do anything that they can't pull the trigger and do a trade because they can't get in a, on something that might have price movement because they're worried about when they don't know what they're doing and, and they feel like when they start looking in the newspaper or the on their quote screen, they're going to be hitting themselves with this bad news. And so they're very fearful. So they can't pull the trigger. Then there's those other types that should be in a casino instead of the stock market or whatever. 
And they just, they're, it's real easy for them to pull the trigger. They have no fear at all. And they're, they're destined to blow up somewhere along the way. Uh, a really good trader has a little bit of both, mm. if it makes any sense. You have the ability to rationally look at reward and risk and to sort of do a ratio of them in your mind and realize that taking measured bets and keeping those bets the reasonable size can help protect you against the catastrophic failure. But at the same time, it uh, protects you from, it, it allows you the opportunity of having good fortune smile on you. If you don't ever participate in some markets, you'll never have the potential for a, a good day to come your way because you've, you know, you've, gotten ahead of it and said, no, I'm not going to take on that potential opportunity. So you need the opportunity, but you need to protect yourself while you're going after it. So those are good conditions. I would also say another couple of things to be a, a really exceptional trader would be awareness. Uh, so the reason I say awareness is if you realize that you're deviating from your trading plan or that you're on a diet, but you really like the looks of that chocolate cake. You have to be aware that you're deviating from the plan. And without awareness, it's hard to do that. And I found personally myself, if I was highly caffeinated, my awareness levels went down. This was in my 20s, long time ago. And I used to do a pot or more of coffee a day, and I was just jacked up. And you kind of just rush through your day. You don't really question yourself. You don't sit back and say, well, what if? Uh, and that's dangerous as a trader because you kind of just rush through your your trading strategy and you, and you might be, you know, making a snap decision on something and it's not according to your trading strategy. And you don't, you aren't aware that you're actually deviating from what you normally should be doing according to your plan. So awareness is useful. Another criteria uh, I like in traders is self-esteem. If you don't feel good about yourself, if you kind of think of yourself as uh, a trader rather than a, a husband, a father, uh, a friend, a human being, and feel comfortable with who you are, then uh, trading can bring out all sorts of bad things. Mm. Um, you, you don't feel comfortable with yourself. So you feel like you should fail. And so you figure out a way to fail. Uh, and the trading reflects that. Uh, you, you want to be excited. So you, you know, trade leveraged options or whatever, and you get lots of excitement. So the market gives you exactly what you really want. Oh. But having that high self-esteem means that you don't need that out of the market anymore. You kind of uh, have risen above the effort of being a trader. And that is a very useful thing. So that you, when you close it down on a Friday afternoon, you can enjoy your weekend. You don't have to be sitting there thinking, yeah, I wish the markets were open right now because I'd like to make a trade. And uh, you're addicted. Uh, I think self-esteem is useful. And then I guess the... The last thing I would cover in qualities of a good trader would be the aspect of, of um, how do I put this one? Um, it would be the self-esteem. Um, it'd be sort of the, uh, I don't really care what everybody else is thinking and I don't really care what the market's going to do. Uh, I am prepared and they've, I've thought through the contingencies. I've thought through my plan uh, and I've got everything ready to go. Now it's time to execute. So there's this sort of time, a good trader has the ability to sort of block everything out and execute the plan flawlessly, I say. Yeah, and by flawlessly, I don't, don't just execute the plan, execute it flawlessly. And uh, that's tough to do. I mean, you got internet going down, you got electricity goes out, you know, the phone system goes down, your computer fails. Oh, yeah. 
uh, the, the nurse calls from school and says, your kid's sick. Could somebody come pick them up? All these different things that real life throws at you. And I think the ability to have contingency plans and have focus so that when you sit down and do your work, whether it's once a day or whether it's a day trader being at his desk all day or once a week, you're a traveling salesman and Saturday mornings is your time for the markets, whatever in your own particular strategy and routine is to be able to go into that little cave in focus and have that attention span narrowed down to executing flawlessly. And I think that if you can do that, that really helps a lot too. So those are some, I, I could probably come up with about three or four others, but those are, I think the high points. Oh, well, those are really great. You know, um, when you were talking about everybody gets what they want, it, it's, it sounded quite a bit like Ed Sequoitis. I'm yeah. assuming you're a, you're a mutual fan. Like I, I may have you. stole that from him. I, I, I've been, I've done so many interviews and I've heard so many <laughs> people, I've read so many books. Uh, it just becomes part of the way I talk and I don't even know where I get all this stuff sometimes, but yeah, he might've said that way back in the, I probably heard it in the eighties maybe. Oh, wow. Well, you guys are in good company, obviously. Um, yeah, it's interesting the things you said because it kind of tails into the next two questions I had on my list. So, okay. Um, how much of a system do you use in terms of algorithms and in computers and how much is, I know there's not the system's the trader and the trader's the system, but the question I had was how often do you override the system? And I know it's kind of a trick question in, in a sense, it's a little complicated to answer that one. It's not that complicated, really. Oh. Uh, the way I, I look at human endeavor is that human beings are uniquely capable of doing art, creating music, and creating trading strategies. So if I had, but trading is also execution and execution is not really thinking a whole lot. It's repetitive. It's somewhat boring if you do it well, because you're doing the same thing you did yesterday and the day before <laughs> that you'll do tomorrow. So the way I, I look at it is I separate human endeavor into the two parts, the mechanical, repetitive, whatever it is I did yesterday, I'm going to do again today type stuff. And then there's the creative, the ability to do research, to come up with a new trading strategy, to solve this problem that you suffered over in this particular market during this particular time period, to think of that through. <laughs> Excuse me. So when you do that, you end up with these two things. Once I create a strategy, I try to incorporate everything I would do in this other part, the, the tactical execution part. So if I, I don't know, if way back when sometime I wanted, I had this great tendency to want to override this trade for this specific reason, and the reason made sense. When I'm not trading, I would go with my creative side and either put that into the strategy if it makes sense or do a research project on it and figure out, does that make sense? What I did, I did this override way back when. At this point in my life, you know, at 70 years old, um, I was last August, I've gotten to the point where I've incorporated everything into my strategies that I can think of that I would ever want to do. So I don't override at all. I oh. just run the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. And a lot of it's automated and, uh, and it's, it allows me the time to be able to be on Twitter and answer people's questions and do interviews and stuff like that, because I'm not sitting here all day, uh, agonizing over overriding my strategy and, uh, and suffering the stress of that too, because once you start overriding what your well-laid plan, you get into this psychological never, never land mm -hmm. where or twilight zone or something where you really don't want to be because there's a lot more stress. You're not going to be Mr. Serenity for sure. You're going to be, did I make the right decision to override this thing or not? And then you're going to go high or low. You're going to be, Oh, I was right. I'm glad I override it. Oh, adrenaline. Yay. Going to celebrate tonight. 
or it's going to be, uh, you know, kick Tom in the behind for overriding the strategy and doing something stupid. And how come I can't follow my strategy? And you just beat yourself up. And neither of those extremes is a good place to be as a trader. Better to just say, you know, the strategy is the strategy. I ran it today flawlessly and it produced a loss. That's trading. Don't worry about it. In researching you, Tom, you know, and I love a lot of your, um, ba- what I call them basilisms. You know, sometimes I um, copy or, or uh, save the image and use it for a LinkedIn post. And I, I didn't even know I had basilisms. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're out there on, on uh, if you, you Google Tom Basso quotes and hit images in Google, it, it pulls up some great pictures of you. Um, you know, one of the ones we love is as long as you learn something from a loss, it's, it's not really a loss. And, you know, it, it's something, um, you know, Tony and I have talked a lot about in, in my, Tony Confleet, our mutual friend, wanted to make sure we plug him in here. You know, we've sure. talked a lot in my personal, very much, much smaller scale operation um, that, you know, you're never going to make everything right, that you have to trust your, your system and you've developed it. And when it goes wrong, you fix this, you know, you tweak the system perhaps, but you don't beat yourself up and you don't go and ego trade like you know i know what you're gonna say you know you don't go and now take on more risk because you're trying to fix the loss on that that's just a recipe for disaster i know i'm preaching to the choir but even outside of trading just in business and in in any type of investing it's easy to happen you know you you bought a house in you know phoenix and it doesn't have the kind of returns that you have and you sell it and you you beat yourself up too much you know, or you bought a building in, in, you know, Indianapolis and it loses some money. You sold it. You did the right thing. You did the risk mitigation, but now you're afraid to pull the trigger, right? On the next purchase. It was something Tony did a lot of mentoring with me on really getting into the psychology internally and understanding that if um, I'm too much on hard, rational facts, that I, I create my own risk system by not being in touch with human psychology. So I, I just wanted to tell you, you're just so spot on it. This is something all investors should learn. I, you know, I, some people look at trading and they're like, okay, it's, it's a bunch of quant geeks sitting behind a screen, chain smoking cigarettes and their their personal lives are a disaster. And I want to tell people, no, no, Tom Basso's nickname, Mr. Serenity is because he's managed to do it the right way and be a wonderful golfer, a good husband, travel. I hear you're quite the cook and a, and a wine connoisseur. And I, I just think the world of you is it's, to me, you're the, the embodiment of, you know, balancing the left and the right brain in a healthy way. Yeah. I, really, I just want you know, I and think it's really you know, cool. If you think of the re- left and right, it's, it's back to what I was talking about, the creative part of the human mind mm-hmm. versus the execution part of trading. You know, uh, if you spend enough time automating and want to invest the money in the computers and all that, chances are most of every person's strategies out there if you could get the right data source, get the right computers, the fast enough computers, everything, make the right connections on the order flow and everything, you could probably automate everything you're doing down to just hitting a button and walking away. That's now, right. personally, I find there's errors in code and data sometimes comes through flawed. So I like to have a human being, and, and that's me, of course overseeing what the computers are doing and just kind of saying, does that look like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? Just for no other reason, maybe to pollinate my brain with an idea of how to make my trading strategies better. But if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, I just walk away and go hit balls or I walk away and I start dinner or I, uh, you know, after this interview, I'll probably, I'm thinking of just doing a, a few laps around the, the complex that we're living in right now, mm-hmm. temporarily while we're renovating our new house. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I'll get some exercise in and, and it's in the middle of the trading day. It's like it's yeah. nine, nine 30 here. The markets have been open for uh, what, two hours. And I'm going to go out and walk around in the sun to get some sun and vitamin D and, and uh, just relax. And, um, think through what I want to do the rest of the day and got a couple of other errands I'm going to run. And then, you know, this afternoon sometime I'll be running my uh, daily run. It'll take me right now. It's down to about 40 minutes or so, and I'll have everything done for Monday. So 
that's kind of, but you know, did I do that like yesterday? <laughs> no, I've been working on this all my life. So don't expect as a trader to start out and have, you know, Tom Basso's nine strategies uh, across like right now, probably close to 60 positions oh, wow. and have that all to where you can do that in 40 minutes a day. <laughs> That's, it's taken me a lot of years to get to that and, and uh, quite a bit of an expenditure of money. We figured when I did Trendstat and we built the Trendstat trading platform and research platform, that was about a million dollars out of my own pocket oh, to wow. build that. That's a lot of uh, a lot of years and a lot of money put into one specific thing to build a, a trading platform. And when I retired, I walked away from all of that except for what was in my head. And we closed down the uh, software, which was getting archaic anyway. And it would have required a lot of money to bring it up to a current standard. So I thought, you know, I don't want to invest that amount of money at, at my age and where I am in life. So I uh, I retired and closed it down and found my employees, some other jobs and went on. And I've been smiling ever since. Yeah, it's not exactly an overnight success, right? <laughs> no, it's been a lot. I've been doing this for, uh, you know, we're coming up on 50 years, I think. Yeah, we were, we were laughing offline that, you know, your first trade was 1975 with, I believe it was two corn contracts. And, you know, it I was, was born in December of 75. So it's, it's quite humbling to me to think that, you know, you've been trading since, you know, I was before I was born. It's it's pretty yeah. humbling. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I, and I still enjoy I, it. I still, yeah, I look forward to doing my, my afternoon run and getting up in the morning and checking out one of my strategies that requires a little bit of a morning checkout. It takes me hmm. five minutes or usually in, unless I made a mistake or a problem shows up or something and I had to I have to take some action to correct it. Um, but yeah, I enjoy doing it. And, but I also enjoy a lot of things. I enjoy cooking. I like golf. I like working out. I'm going to have fun remodeling this new house. I'll, I'll be, doing most of the electronics and electricity and lighting and the landscaping. And my wife, Brenda, will be doing uh, probably the rest. Oh, so, uh, and I will be consulted when I need to be consulted. And other than that, uh, I'm sure it'll be a beautiful house when it's all finished. And, happy uh, happy but, wife, happy life. Yeah, something that's like great that. Advice. That's, that's probably the best advice we're going to give in the entire interview, right, Tom? Right. Um, I have one last question that was uh, my friends were nice enough to um, you know submit in an email, so I don't want to make sure I don't miss it. From a thematic standpoint, without divulging anything pr pr proprietary, and we're not asking you to, um, how do you how does a newer trader set up stop losses? Is it based on uh, the percent risk reward or some other measure? This is from a friend of mine who's um, I wouldn't call him a day trader, but he's he's newer to trading. He's making a career trade and. He wanted to be able to be home more. So this this would be okay. a great question. I would start this conversation with the fact that the vast majority of traders do things backwards. They start with how much they're going to invest in a particular trade. Uh, for example, you're going to buy this stock and you decided you're just going to buy 100 shares. Then they go in. They set up the trade and maybe they're looking at a moving average or whatever they're using. They trigger the trade in the direction that the market's moving, all good and fine. I'm, I'm with everybody so far. And then they decide how do they set their stop? And that's the, boy, that is tough. And they say, well, I can't afford to lose any more than 5%, so I'll set it at 5%. So they take the number and multiply times 5%, subtract it, put the stop in, everything's fine. The problem with that philosophy mathematically, and this is my chemical engineering talking, I view the stock stock market as, in most markets, I would say, as a sort of um, a fluctuating, noise-ridden set of data. So... If you think of a simple example, the thermostat, which in Hawaii, you guys don't need thermostats. You can just leave the window open all the time. But rest of the world, you have thermostats and you set it at a number. And 
so how does it work? So the temperature, sun comes up, you know, air is coming through the, the screen windows. The temperature is fluctuating in your house. The thermostat set on pick a number, 72. If it gets the 74 or so, the thermostat says, whoa, we're getting a little hot. We got to turn on the air conditioning. So it triggers that. And all of a sudden the fan comes on, you hear noise and the, and the house comes down to 72 degrees and then it shuts off. So that's a simple instrumentation control loop. Now let's go to the markets. <clears throat> the markets have a certain amount of fluctuation. You wouldn't want the air conditioner to come on if it went from 70 to 70.2. You don't need to be that accurate with ambient air in a house. So if it had to come on and off, your, your air conditioning would be turning on and off. The compressor would wear out. It'd be terrible. So what you do is you set the thermometer has what's called a sort of a gain or a, an ability to ignore the noise and only take action when it moves beyond the noise. Okay. So a lot of people have techniques for getting into a position, but they don't know what to do with the stop loss because they haven't thought through what is noise and what is not noise. And they've already decided they're going to do a hundred shares. So this will be mathematically for traders listening to this interview, the most profound thing I'm going to say probably in the interview, you should do it backwards. Start with where are you going to put the stop? <clears throat> so now you start thinking about, let's say if you have Keltner bands, you have a top band for a buy and a bottom band for a sell. <clears throat> the noise in the market is everything in between those lines. That's the purpose of having a range. Everything above the top line is, an, is definitely an up market. Everything below a down line is definitely in a downtrend. You could argue where the line should be or what variables you might use or how many days look back or average, whatever you do. Parameters could be debated. But when you get all done debating and you decide on two lines, the top line is the top of the noise and the bottom line is the bottom of the noise. Now, wouldn't it make sense if you're placing a stop to place your stop behind the bottom line if you were buying long? Because you know now this is not noise triggering arbitrarily oh, yeah. some stop you stuck in. This is a meaningful, the market is going the other way. I better get the heck out of this position. Okay. So now you've got a logical stop point. But now what do you do about your position size? You know the risk. You know your equity. You say, I'm willing to take on 1% risk of my portfolio with this position. You do math that you learned in seventh grade. It's in the book that I wrote on position sizing, which goes for $10. Everybody in the world can afford that. And you, you calculate it out. And the answer is 73 shares of the stock. <clears throat> and back in the day, when I first started and before you were born, uh, that was called an odd lot. And the specialists would kind of turn up their noses, the elitists, that they are and they would say oh geez, you know like we have to charge an extra eighth of a point for Never. this hot lot trade and so it got pretty expensive to do the 73 shares so most traders would try to get to 100 200 a thousand some round number nowadays computers the specialists are kind of gone and you've got computers matching up bids and asks and you, they don't care 73 is just easy is easy to execute as 100 200 or uh you know 10,000 so you can then specify your share size wherever you want down to the share. And now you even have fractional shares. Yeah. You can go below a single share. Theoretically, you could do, you know, 0. 0.2 shares of Amazon if you wanted at a lot of brokerage houses. So the reversal in your thinking should be what is logical to set your stop by the technique you're using to get in. In my case, Hey, if I'm getting in with a Keltner buy on the top line, I'm going to use the Keltner sell for my stop loss. So I'll put it right on the line. That's that. So that says I've gone through the noise band. I'm now going into a down market. I don't want to be in this thing anymore. So I'm, that's where my stop is. Then taking that amount of risk, I then calculate 
how many shares do I do? So if you look at my ETF holdings, oh my God, they're all, there's not a single one of them is on a round number. They're all. I think that'll really, I think that'll really help my, uh, my so friends. So reverse your thinking, start with where's the logical place to put a stop by your philosophy or strategy that you're using. And if it's a short-term strategy, like a nine-day strategy, probably use sort of nine-day parameters for your stops. Mm. Calculate that first, then calculate how much you want to buy or sell to stay within your uh, a tolerable risk levels to keep your portfolio nice and smooth instead of doing it the other way around and deciding on the size first and then trying to figure out what to do with the stop. You'll find it a lot easier. That's really great. I think my friend Curtis is going to love this. You know, this transitions well because I wanted to read a quote, but it, where I'm going with it is how you're talking about the, the wrong sequence of the mental process. You know, and this is a one of my favorite Tom Basso quotes that you know you'll find on the internet, Tom. And I didn't know you didn't know that you're all over the place. Um, um, it says, I think investment psychology is by far the most important element, followed by risk control, with the least important consideration being the question of where to to where you buy and sell. Yeah. And I just find it so fascinating because I would never articulate it nearly as well as you, but I would always lament to investors that it seems like we would do the process in the wrong order of things or that, you know, we're, we're, that, you know, I have a calculator and my comfort is cold, hard facts. And I would exclude all else, you know, clearly to my detriment or, you know, that, that, that archetype, you know, clear that archetype. How is it that a chemical engineer and a man who's obviously very bright um, made the, the jump to really understanding the, the system of investing and, to marry, you know, like you were talking about, to be balanced, the mechanical and, and the um, the creative. How, how how did you do that? Uh, the hard way, um, <laughs> okay. to, to put it bluntly. Uh, I would encourage people to do it the easier way. And I can kind of tell you what that would be. Uh, I started out just like everybody, obsessed with where do I buy, where do I sell? Mm -hmm. And it just was this obsession. And I've got charts and I'm looking at patterns and breakouts and all this stuff and and uh, trying to figure out what am I going to do? And I am I have no risk control, no position sizing. And I have no idea what I'm doing with my mind at that point. I'm just trying to, I'm a newbie, trying to deal with my own emotions and everything. Well, what, what I think most people do is they start out with the buy-sell decision and they obsess over that. I mean, they run they get on their um, interactive brokers terminal or something, and they'll try every single indicator that is somewhere buried into you yeah. know, the chart program. See what it looks like. See what it could do with it. What? Try to understand it. Move on to the next one. Every day, you're looking at five or ten more. Yeah. Um, That's me. What you end up with, uh, and I did this in a presentation I did with Singapore, I think, uh, this last fall. I took a chart of something like crude oil, and I think I put five different trend following models on there. And I'm going to try to guess what they were. I believe it was a, a Keltner. I had a Donchin channel. I had a Bollinger band. I had a moving average or two moving average crossover. And I had something else. I'm trying to remember what that was. Um, Maybe it was one of my own indicators that I created way back when. I, I forget now. I think there was four or five different ones. And I put the arrows for each of those indicators on where up arrow for a buy and down arrow for a sell. And I showed that crude oil, you know, obviously has had some huge moves in the last few years, both up and down. Mm -hmm. And of course, I trade both directions. So it doesn't make any difference to me. I feel like you can make money when it goes down too. So... When I put those on the chart and showed it to everybody, you could see that here's five different indicators with yeah. roughly the same parameters. They're all like 21 days or something. And you could see that the arrows give you the buy signals slightly different, but all within a day of each other. Oh. And they give you the sell signals all within a day of each other. And you're picking up this humongous thing on the chart. You know, you're going from 
40 to 80 on crude oil or, or 80 to 20 or whatever. Why are you worried about one day being early or late? It doesn't make that much difference. You're picking up this huge chunk of capital. That's the important thing. So then you start realizing, and I did the study way back when, and it's being redone from a, um, very interestingly by an Italian guy that I'm, I've offered to help either co-author it or help at least edit it because, excuse me, English is not his first language. So uh, I, I told him I'd be happy to clean up the English if he wants me to. But I'm really interested because he did, uh, he's doing it, my random number um, generator test. And the way you do that is you take a database and you flip a coin. If you don't have a position at the end of the day, you flip a coin. If it's heads, you buy uh, that particular position tomorrow at market open. If it's a tail, you sell it the next day at open at market. Then what you do is you apply your best technology on position sizing and your best technology on having a, a trailing stop that makes some kind of sense given the parameters that you're using. And you run it across lots of years, lots of markets, mm -hmm. and you just, or lots of stocks, whatever you're, you're doing with the study. And what you find if you run this, because you're using random number generator, you can't just run it once. You have to run it like a thousand times because every track record is going to be different because the coin flips are going to be different. So I would set up a loop and just let this thing run overnight. And it would run a thousand cases. And then it would summarize those individually, the best case, the worst case, and what was the average. And, you know, you could run a thousand cases day after day after day after day after day after day. And they always averaged out to a profit. And you're using a coin flip to get into the position. So what does that say to you on the importance wow. of your entry? Oh, geez. Wow. That's um, probably going to take me and some of our viewers um, a little while to fully digest. Um, you just kind of dropped a bomb on us. No, I tell you, here's the easy way to absorb it. The money is made in what you would call the black swan moves, the big moves that, you know, like uh, back in the Trump years where the stock market seemed like it was hitting new highs just about every other day, every week it was up. You know, you've got an extended black swan event to the good side. And then, of course, there's the black swan, you know, the crash of 87, the uh, the debacle in 2008 with real estate, those types of black swans to the negative side. And of course, if you're a trader like myself, I go both directions. I don't really care. Uh, so black swans are these major movements. And the easy way to absorb it is if you're, let's say you're going to have a black swan event to the upside. And the coin flip came out sell. So the next morning I sell, I put the stop above it. Market goes up. I get stopped out. As soon as I get stopped out, I hit the, flip, the coin flip again. Comes up sell again. I put the stop above it. Market continues to go up. I take another loss. I'm out again. I flip it one more time. This time it comes up buy. So now I'm in on the long side. And for the rest of that black swan, I'm in just completely right where it needs to be. So um, what ends up happening is the, uh, I think what you, you're you really saying to yourself is, and it kind of says what I, I was saying a little while ago, it doesn't make that much difference about which indicator you use. As long as you somewhere along the way, get in on that black swan, you're going to make so much money. You don't have to worry about all the, the, the minutia. It pays for a whole lot of uh, of little negative, you know, cut your losses short types trades. You need to let your gains run, cut your losses short. And the random number generator does that. It just, it sooner or later will get you in the right direction. And it might be a couple of days late, but if you're going to be in on the trade for six months, who cares? That is just You're going to make so much. So that's that's why the logic works. But now position sizing, that's another whole thing. You got to be on your game with position sizing all the time if you want to smooth out your track record. If you just buy something and then you hold it, 
and and everything you're going you're in the middle of the black swan and you're on the right direction so good for you you're making a ton of money if you don't manage that position along the way and i know there's those out there in the industry jerry parker comes to mind and others that disagree with me 100 percent on this and we just choose to to disagree uh I I understand the math completely, and I am into return to risk ratio. He is more into, let's say, return. If you want the most return, then you got to hang on for dear life, and you'll go all over the map, and you, you're going to see some wild drawdowns and some wild uh, swings in your portfolio equity each day. I prefer not to. I'm retired. I'm enjoying life. I don't need that. And I think there's a lot more people in my camp than there are in the let's make a lot of money at all costs type of camp. And so I would say to you that uh, managing your risk and your position size is far more important because if you do that every day, you can smooth out your results, improve your return to risk ratios, obsessing over where do you buy or sell? Forget that. Spend 80% of your research effort on figuring out your position sizing and your portfolio diversification and your correlations amongst the instruments that you use, that's going to be so much more beneficial to your return to risk ratio than is to worry about whether you use a Keltner or a Bollinger or a Dunshan or a moving average or a point and figure breakout or whatever you decide in the end. That won't make a whole lot of difference in the end. What will make a lot of difference is the position sizing. And working on your mental side, being disciplined really, and having a plan and following the plan. I think this is really going to help all the young traders out there. And, you know, even just the arm, more of the amateur armchair traders like me. You know, Tom, I've, I've monopolized all the time with my questions. And um, I wanted to open it up to you since we're at the tail end of our interview with a little, you know, five, 10 minutes left. What would you like to talk about? I know we talked offline a little about, um, you know, currencies, you know, being a little wacky lately. What would you like to talk about? Well, I, you know, I think what, when I look at my Twitter, you know, like 40 something thousand Twitter followers and the questions they throw in my way and the comments that get made. One of the things that I think can help new traders, all traders, really, if they want to look at it this way is because the world <clears throat> is a constantly changing thing. News hits and it's instantaneous. <clears throat> Something happens in Ukraine and you know you know about it five minutes later on your newsfeed. Um, markets get what appear to be more erratic or more volatile. And people always ask me, have you thought that the markets, if the markets changed? You know, I mean, I've been trading for 50 years, wow. so I have some perspective in that. And I would say, not really, except that everything has gotten faster thanks to computers, where it used to take to trade a trillion shares of, say, um, the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, if you're doing 10 million a day, do the math and figure out how many days, you know, you got to take most of 1974 to get up to a trillion shares traded. And now, you know, on a good day, we can trade a trillion shares, uh, you know, in, in a day or two. Uh, and I think that that's just because computers can handle data so much more efficiency, efficiently. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people ask me is, you know, what do you think the market's going to do? You know, what do you think the Japanese yen is going to do? What do you think crude yeah. is going to do? What do you think stock market is going to do? And my tongue in cheek answer would like to be, if I was being truthful and just being forthright with them, is the market will go up, down, or sideways. That's really what I predict will happen. So if I think of the markets that way, and I don't predict, I don't psychologically push myself to one camp, the bullish camp or the bearish camp, or the, oh, we're going to go sideways forever here. This is going to be a boring year camp. Uh, I just try to design strategies. I have strategies to try to deal with sideways markets. I have strategies that slay it when we go up, like yesterday. I have, you know, things like futures in two directions where I can, you know, crude oil went negative back uh, during COVID. I was short. I mean, I made a lot of money on crude oil shorting it. And people say, well, it can't go negative. It did. Yeah. So don't use the word can't. 
it, the markets will do what the markets will do. It's one of my favorite Bossoisms is uh, <laughs> get, get out of the predicting business. Do not. If you if I go down my feed in Twitter and I then rate every single comment that has something to do with the market about whether or not that person is predicting something versus those people who are talking about strategy or about position sizing or about return to risk ratios or some study they did on interest rates or whatever, you'll find, uh, I bet you it's 80, 20 people trying to predict. For some reason, the human being loves to predict. And that's probably one of the things that I would encourage all your investors, whether it be passive investors and they have an advisor helping them or whether it be a, an actual trader who's trying to do it himself, I would encourage you to try to stay out of the predicting business, stay in the measurement business and stay in the reacting to the trend business. And you're so much, it's so much easier on your brain and emotions and everything else. And it's so much more able to be replicated day after day after day. The predicting business gets you Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. You get into this really, really funky place where you're either patting yourself on the back for being right or kicking yourself in the butt for being wrong. And it's just not a good place to be psychologically. So I think you that's kind of where I, I see a lot of new traders obsessing over predicting and it's just not helpful. My audience... I have a sub stack article that i wrote on that <clears throat> same subject it was a good one that's a good plug that's a great plug due to time i'm, I'm going to ask you i want to get one more question in but i'm going to make sure i don't forget this part um okay at the end of an interview we're always supposed to to say how do people find you you know um you've mentioned your sub stack and i know you have your website enjoy the ride which i always love how you always end your uh, linkedin posts and enjoy the ride i'm more of a linkedin guy than a Twitter guy, but I'm, I'm loosening up to it. Um, where, where, what should people be reading from Tom Basso or checking you out on and on your different social medias and, and endeavors? Well, if you don't want to waste a lot of time, whenever I do something on Substack, I like to think it's well thought out and it covers a topic reasonably concisely. I find it hard to, to say, make a Twitter post in 280 characters and really get across all of the different aspects of what I'm trying to, um, you know, wisdom that I'm trying to impart to someone. Um, and sometimes it takes more than 280 characters. And I guess Musk is going to, is talking about expanding that. And I'll make, I think, Twitter more accessible for a lot of other purposes. So I think that's probably a good way to go for him. Um, in my own case, if I can if I'm doing a psychological topic or if I'm doing a, uh, a topic on like, don't predict, um, I can do a sub stack with a few pages and um, that covers the topic beautifully and I can cover all aspects of it. So I think that's probably the easiest thing. If you're looking for just updates on whether I'm long the hedge or, or out of the hedges or have the hedges on, that you can either go to the website or just uh, follow me on Twitter, something like that. That's easy because I can do that in a short little post. If you're looking to um, ask me a detailed question, and I would encourage people to make it detailed, not, I get these questions sometimes on an email that say, hi, I'm starting trading. What would you suggest I do? Uh, uh, you know, that's like a I novel. can't even answer that if you gave me a day. Um and I certainly don't want to do it, you know, on an email. I, I, I don't, I'm not sitting here trying to, I'm not getting paid to do this. You know, I'm helping people out. <laughs> if you have a specific question, include as much information on it. What's the size of your account? What markets do you trade? How long you've been trading? What kind of background do you have? How, what time do you spend per day doing this or per week or whatever? And get all of that background in there and then say, Tom, here's the question. When I am looking to buy something, I don't know where to put my stop. All right, fine. That's a specific question. I can address that a little easier. And, you know, in a paragraph or two, I can probably cover what needs to be covered. But 
you know, I'm happy to help people, but um, I'm also <laughs> cognizant of not, I don't want to sit here in front of a computer answering emails all day either. So just be as specific as possible. I'm happy to help. But a lot of times people will play off of something I've said in a Twitter or Facebook post or a LinkedIn post, and then I can react to their specific uh, uh, concern or question in there. So I'm available in a lot of places. I'm on MeWe Parlor. I'm on um, Telegram. I'm on, um, what am I missing? Getter. Oh my gosh. Wow. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Substack. I so I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. All right. And I have an email. It's the same email I've had for 50 years, tom at trendstat.com. That's so cool. I, I just really want to thank you. I know I'm, I don't want to overdo it, but like really, I'm just so appreciative, Tom. This is no, like a master fun. class for all the young traders out there or just people like me that are armchair enthusiasts. I'm going to ask yeah. one last dumb question. This is a rhetorical question, but I kind no of got to ask you, is it something I've been telling my friends? But they don't listen to me because I'm their friend. But if Tom Basso says it, maybe they'll listen. Are we are the the retail crowd like me, the you know less sophisticated guys? Are we spending too much time making interest rate uh, predictions? The Fed's going to pivot. The Fed's not going to pivot, and we're wasting our time. We should be focusing more on the the mechanics of setting up our systems and understanding our psychology and attacking risk mitigation and developing a robust yeah. system. Here's the here's the way I answer that one. Whenever you, the farther you get away from price, see, wh when we buy and sell as traders, how do we make money? We buy low, sell high, we sell high, buy low, right? It's the price movement that creates our profits and losses. The farther we get away from measuring price, interest rates, the GDP, what the Fed's going to do, all these other things that are out there. Now we're starting to take data that may be useful for life. I mean, I'm in the middle of doing a new house. I kind of like to know where interest rates were uh, because I'm going to have to be hiring contractors and you know all that stuff. So interest rates do affect my life now, but I don't let that and my predictions of interest rates at all enter into what I do with trading. Yeah, I think too many people are obsessed with whether the Fed's going to pivot or not. You're predicting. Get out of the prediction business and say, stock market's going up right now. It's on an uptrend. I should be long. And that's all the thought you got to give it. I don't, I'm not more cerebral than that. And if I, I, next I week I get a sell signal, I will be out of the markets on the ETFs. I will have the hedges on. I will you know, be short bonds or whatever, and I'll be enjoying that ride. I don't really care. And I think that's the mentality you have to get to is get out of the worrying about interest rates and worrying about what the economy is going to do. And, you know, is Donald Trump going to come back and run or is it is Biden going to run again? And all these, what ifs? Who cares if the stock market is not going to pay attention to it? It's not important to worry about. If it is, it's still not important because the prices are already moving. Just react to the price and you, you've, you're right on. You're focusing all your efforts on that which is going to make or lose you money. And that's important as a trader. That's wonderful advice, Tom. Thank, thank you again um, so, so much. I, I can't tell you, I really appreciate it. And you know, I want to give a special thought, shout out to Tony Confliti, you know, my mentor, who's our, our mutual friend who was kind enough yeah. to set this up. And no, Tony's thank you, an interesting Tom. guy. <laughs> yeah. And if, if I ever could have you on it, you know, sometime in the future and you want to, if you're thinking, hey, wait, we, we skipped this one topic, or I really would have loved to talk more about this. You know, I would always be thrilled to have you back on, Tom. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, or, exercise, you know, today around the complex. Yeah, we can do that the other way, too. If you come up with some, you know, things that in discussions or you see my LinkedIn and you you uh, kind of jot down some things that are intriguing. We can do this. It's easy for me to do a Zoom session and I enjoy them. I, I had a blast today and I hope uh, it was helpful for people. Well, I think this is going to be extremely popular with, with uh, young traders or like I say, armchair enthusiasts like me. Thank you so much, sir. Great. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right.